Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories, where we play tales to take you away from today. On the show, we feature a story from last week that has taken the RAS community by storm. That will make more sense later. I should hope so. Mmm, yeah. We have two short tales about lights in the sky and another one taken from the pages of Astounding Magazine. It has Yeti, diamonds, and even rockets. I thought you might like that. After all of that, we have an intermission. Huh. That will make sense as well. Oh, Ron, can I say it, please? Sure, alien creature. Go ahead. Here it is. Our five-minute mystery. Another five-minute mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by the word precipice. I really hate this word. It's just so pretentious, and one of those that only fancy people say, or maybe Dracula. I don't know, but I do know you should just say Cliff. Here's our story. Martha, I I have something to ask you. Darling, it's been such a lovely afternoon here on the mountain. Martha, I, I want a divorce. Divorce? Yes, there is someone else. I need my freedom. No, I won't give it to you. I thought that would be your answer, my dear. Then why did you ask me? Because, Martha, I did not want to kill you. Howard? Yes, Martha. I've got to be rid of you. That's why I brought you to the mountain. There is a precipice over there. It is a long fall, my dear. <laughs> Might as well begin with a description of the events leading up to your wife's falling over the precipice. As you wish, Sergeant. It was such a lovely afternoon that Martha, my wife, and I decided to come up here to the mountain. We brought some lunch with us and planned to make a day of it. About what time was that, sir? I, it was about three o'clock. Mm, I see. That was going, please? About four o'clock, it began to thunder. And very shortly thereafter, lightning and rain started. Did you find shelter? Yes. We were rather fortunate to find a cave about a hundred yards from here on the west side of the mountain. What time uh, did it stop raining? About uh, an hour later, Sergeant. What did you do then? This is quite a lot of questioning, Sergeant. Is it all necessary? Yes, I'm afraid it is. I, I hope you don't object. We're almost through. No, not if it is necessary. Well, uh, to continue. We left the cave and continued to the crest of the mountain. As we got to the top, my wife called my attention to a rainbow, which had suddenly appeared to the west behind the sun. And that was about five o'clock? Yes. Well, when Martha saw the rainbow, she suggested, as a sort of joke, that we try to follow to the end of the rainbow. You know the pot of gold at the rainbow's end? Yes, of course. Uh, Uh, What happened after she suggested it? I laughed and tried to dissuade Martha from the idea, but she began running down the incline and waiting for me to follow her. Did you? No, I shouted for her to turn back, but she was running downhill too quickly to stop. Suddenly, she slipped on some loose rock and fell down. She turned over and over and rolled right off the precipice. It was horrible. There was no way you could have helped her? Of course not. Are you insinuating... No, my mountain climbing friend, I'm merely saying that I don't believe your story. It's a lie. How does the state policeman know that Howard lied in the story of how his wife met her death? In just a moment, we'll know, but first... A lie sounded good to me. That is, if I hadn't been there for the killing and all. When you think about it, it's all rather dark and creepy, and they used the word precipice way too many times. I would have much rather they used the word escarpment. Now that is a ring to it. 
And now, back to our story. Howard, your story contained one rather obvious flaw which condemns it as a lie. You told me just a few minutes ago that after the storm cleared, you and your wife discovered a rainbow to the west, behind the sun, which, my friend, is an impossibility. A rainbow is always formed opposite the sun by the reflection of its rays. Done in by a rainbow. What would the trout say? Did you know that the word rainbow originates from the old English renboga, ren meaning rain, and boga meaning bow? Imagine the arch shape of an arrow making flight through the air, and I think you get the idea. I think this mystery should have been brought to you by the word rainbow. I have to say that I've been playing around with the podcast stats, and I have some interesting facts. First, if we can get 13,221 more people to download the show, we will reach the 1 million download mark. That is pretty cool. If my calculations hold out, we should hit this sometime in early March. Second, we have two active listeners in Russia. I can't tell you any more than that because the whole thing is on the down low. Or maybe it's just because they don't break it down any further than that. I don't know. To our friends in Russia, I say, Privet ot Rona. Thirdly, you might be asking what area of the world has the most active listeners? Well, that would be California with 3,164. Which region has the least? What well, you might think it's Russia, but you'd be wrong. Actually, it's Tanzania with one. So hello to Tanzania. Nearby Kenya has three. How about that? I received this email from Cindy Coleman from Fairfax, Virginia. She writes, Hey Ron, love the podcast and I tell anyone who'll listen all about it. I was going through your archives and I see that you have changed the show a lot since you first started. How did the format evolve? I'm starting a podcast of my own and I want to know how you did it. Well, Cindy, that is a tough question. I really don't know how to answer this other than trial and error. What works for me probably won't work for you. I think my biggest enlightenment was that people wanted to hear what I think about things, or rather, the things that I think about. I just modeled the show enough to open it up for feedback. Bottom line, I listened and learned from you guys. That really is how it all came about. Also, podcasting is fluid. I'm trying new things all the time to see what sticks or what falls flat. Thank you for the question, Cindy. I hope you like the answer. One more thing. I'm looking at doing another ghost-themed show, so I am looking for your scary stories about the ghosties. I'm also looking for a co-host, so if you have any suggestions on that, or maybe you want to apply for the job, let me know. Now, let's move on with the show with this message from Audible. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle, whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to right now? The Space Race an Audible original narrated by Kate Mulgrew. I love history, and that should come as no surprise to you. 
This one is a major documentary drama that brings to life the past, present, and future of man's exploration of space. It is wonderfully narrated by Kate Mulgrew, who is the captain of the Voyager for seven seasons of Star Trek. Here's a bit of what you will hear from this Audible book. Between July 1969 and December 1972, 12 men walk on the moon. That's just closed. Barely. Hey, Jack, don't lock it. I'm not going to lock it. We got we to gotta go back there. You lose the key and we're in trouble. They collect rocks, okay. conduct experiments, it's jump, drive, there. and even sing. I was strolling on the moon one day. In the merry, merry month of December. Now, May. 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 That's right. It seems like the beginning of a great adventure. And as we leave the moon and Taurus Literal, we leave as we came, and God willing, as we shall return, with peace and hope for all mankind. God speed the crew of Apollo 17. But since those final words, spoken by Apollo 17 commander Gene Cernan, no one has been back. Ah, shoot. Okay, hey, let's get off. Forget the camera. Challenger Houston, we'd like to terminate ascent feed now. In 2014, Cernan visits the site where the Apollo missions left the Earth, Launch Complex 39, and he's not happy. Considering where we were half a century ago when Americans were walking on the moon it's incredible and yet we obliterated that piece of history yeah it was more than nostalgic it was disappointing and i do indeed do not want to remember those launch pads that sent us to the moon at kennedy the way i saw them here ignition sequence started all engines are started we have ignition two one zero we have a liftoff we have a liftoff, and it's lighting up the area. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center as the Saturn V is moving off the pad. Something's it's wrong. It's not right. It's not the way it was supposed to be. All we've done now is proved we can do it, close the barn door, and said, you know, be happy about it. And that's not good enough. We are going to go back to the moon. Why? All we did was prove we can work and survive up there. Now we got to take advantage of the resources the moon has to offer us here on this planet. And it's a stepping stone to go to that place called Mars. With unprecedented access, the space race takes listeners to the Virgin Galactic Space Program in the Mojave Desert, features conversations with Buzz Aldrin, Gene Carmen, Tim Peake, and numerous key players at Mission Control. This Audible original takes you behind the scenes to see how these exciting adventures in outer space came to be. You can have the space race today. Here is what Audible has set up for us. Audible is offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you too can head into space with Kate Mulgrew. Thank you, Audible. And now, it's time for your stories. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. Every once in a while, we get a story that gets a strong reaction from you guys. That was the case of last week's story from Charlie White. He called it The Lights on Mount Charleston. Basically, while gazing up at the Nevada night sky, he had an encounter with something. I received three emails and a tweet about it. Two of them I read to you now. This first one comes from Scott Wilson 
a return storyteller from Texas. In his first story, Scott told us about a UFO flyby he had while delivering some cattle to a buyer. He told that story in our 400th episode. This time, Scott writes, Hey Ron, the story from Charlie sent chills down my spine. It brought back a memory I had as a child. It's one of the reasons I watched the Texas night sky every night. I was out riding my pony, Rocky, on a cool summer night. We often rode at night because the days were too hot and horses still need exercise. Rocky started to act up a bit. I tried to calm him down, but he wasn't having any. He bucked me off and took off for home, leaving me with a bruised, um, ego? I started walking and happened to look up into the night sky. I saw a twinkle and then a bright flash of light. It's almost impossible to describe, but that's the best I can do. To Charlie, thank you for your story. I had forgotten all about this event. Scott Wilson, Houston, Texas. Well, thank you, Scott, for your story. I have spent quite a bit of time in Texas, and the night sky there is something, especially when you get out of the big cities. This next response to Charlie's story comes from an old friend from Germany, Tom Williams. Tom is a part of the Ron's Amazing Stories family, and there's no better way to put it. He has contributed so much to the show and has his very own segment called Growing Up. I encourage you that if you've not heard his stories, look for him on the main website at ronsamazingstories.com and search for Tom Williams. Here's Tom's response. Hello, Ron, and greetings from across the pond. Listening to your podcast number 419, and particularly Charlie White's experience with the night sky and moving light, it brought back an incident that I experienced last winter's night. On this cold and cloudless night, I stepped out onto the balcony for a breath of fresh air and to observe the clear night sky. In that moment, I was remembering what my hometown sky was like as I grew up. Lying on my back, on the front porch, I was always amazed at the sight of the millions and millions of stars above, and was thinking if there was any intelligent life forms, maybe looking back and wondering the very same thing about me. This old memory made me wonder how many stars could I now count even with the big city lights of Berlin. Unfortunately, I was only able to count no more than ten, and that was even with squinting. What a state of affairs, I thought. How many city people will never have the wonder of this part of nature that I have experienced? Then I thought about those possible beings who may really visit our planet after all. As I was watching closer at the tiny specks, I noticed two stars about two inches away from each other. With serious thought in mind, I thought strongly, Should you really be there? Please send me a signal. To my surprise, of the two stars close to each other, the one on the right started to move towards its neighbor. Before it reached the other star, a laser-like beam shot straight into my eyes and filled my complete brain and skull with light. It was only a second, and it didn't blind me at all. The star then vanished, leaving only its neighbor. That left me with only one thought, and that was, thank you. So here is to that wonderful nature of star-filled skies that many may never really see. Oh, and safe journey home to those who took the time to say hello. Sincerely, Tom Williams, Berlin, Germany. Wonderful story, Tom, as always, and I hope I read it as well as you would have. The night sky truly is amazing. Living here in Washington, we don't get many totally clear nights. The Pacific Northwest can be a cloudy place, but in those rare nights when the night sky comes forth, we too can see the universe. It makes it clear to me that we can't be alone. 
My thanks to Scott and Tom for these stories, and also to at Jane Dokus and Mike Holden, who were also moved by Charlie's story. featured story for this week comes from the pages of Astounding Magazine, July of 1931. Stories like this one were as popular as video games or Star Wars The Mandalorian is today. These pulp mags of the past fed the imagination of youth and adults alike and continue to do it. Now, I was fascinated with this one because it could have been written just as easily today locked in a rocket and fired into space such was the fate that awaited young stoddard at the end of the diamond trail it is called the diamond thunderbolt by h thompson rich and features answers to the questions that i ask myself all the time it is expertly read for us by james white take it away james section eight of astounding stories 19 July 1931. Professor Norman Prescott, leader of the American Kinchinjunga expedition, crept from his dog tent, perched eerily at the 26,000 foot level of this unscaled Himalayan peak, the third highest in the world. With anxious eyes, he searched the appalling slopes that lifted another 2,000 feet to its majestic summit, now glistening in the radiance of sunset. Where was young Jack Stoddard, official geologist and crack mountaineer of the party? That morning, Professor Prescott and Stoddard had set off together from Camp No. 4 at the 22,000-foot level. Mounting laboriously but swiftly, they had reached the present area by noon. There, Stoddard had left the leader of the expedition and pushed on alone to reconnoiter a razorback ridge that looked as though it might prove the key to the summit. But the afternoon had passed. The daring young geologist had promised to return in an hour, and now it was sunset, with still no sign of him. Professor Prescott sighed, and a bitter expression crossed his bronze, lined face. Just one more evidence of the cursed luck that had marked the expedition from the start. Well, he knew that he must head down at once for Camp No. 4, or risk death on this barren, windswept slope. And equally well, he knew that to go would be to leave his brave companion to his fate, providing he had not already met it on those desolate ridges above. Yes, and another thing he knew, the report of this latest disaster would mean the doom of the expedition. The terrified superstitious natives would bolt, claiming the snow people had struck again. Gods of the mountain, they called them. Those mysterious beings they alone seemed to see, evil spirits who kept guard over this towering realm, determined none should gain its ultimate heights. Tensely, Professor Prescott stood there on that narrow shelf of glacial ice, peering off into the sunset. A hundred miles to the west, bathed in the refulgence of a thousand rainbows, rose the incredible peak of Everest, mightiest of all mountains yet less than 1,000 feet higher than Kinchinjunga. And down, straight down those almost vertical slopes up which the expedition had toiled all summer, lay gorges choked with tropical growth. Off to the south, a scant 50 miles away, the British health station of Darjeeling flashed its white villas in the coppery glow. An awesome spectacle, one that human eyes had seldom, if ever, seen yet from the summit so invitingly near. Perhaps even now Stoddard was witnessing this incomparable sight. To push on, to join him, meant triumph, to head down, defeat, while to stay, to wait. Grimly, Professor Prescott left his insecure perch and headed up over that razorback ridge whence the young geologist had vanished. As he proceeded cautiously along, Drawing sharp, quick breaths in the rarefied upper atmosphere, he told himself it was ambition 
that was leading him on. But in his heart, he knew it was not so. In his heart, he knew he was going to the rescue of his gallant companion, though the way meant death. A hundred yards had been gained, perhaps two, each desperate foothold fraught with peril of a plunge into the yawning abysms to left and right, when suddenly he spied a figure on a twilight spur ahead. Panting, he paused. It must be stuttered, yet it seemed too small, too ghostly. Professor Prescott waved, but even as he looked for an answering signal, the figure vanished. My eyes, he muttered to himself. I'm getting snowblind. Then he called aloud, Jack, oh Jack, hello. Only an echo greeted the call, and he did not repeat it, but pushed on silently, conserving his energy. Was there truth, after all, in those persistent rumors of the natives about the snow people who inhabited the upper slopes of the Himalayas? His tired brain toyed with the idea, to be cut off sharply by the cheery call, Hi there, Professor! Hi-ho! And gazing upwards toward a jutting crag not ten rods beyond, he saw young Stoddard etched against the darkening sky. In a few joyous steps, Professor Prescott had reached his audacious companion. Thank God, he gasped. I'd given you up for lost. Why give me up for anything so unpleasant, was the genial reply. I've just been enjoying the view. Then, then you reached the top, with a quick intake of breath. Well, not exactly, but I feel on top of the world just the same. The professor's spirits fell. Then I can't see. Of course you can't see, interrupted Stoddard. But look at this. As he spoke, he drew from a pocket of his leather jacket something that caught the last light of the dying day and refracted it with weird brilliance. Professor Prescott blinked. Well? A diamond, as big as your fist. And here's another. His left hand reached into his jacket and produced a second sparkling gem. But, but I don't understand. Granted, but you will, when I tell you I found the diamond thunderbolt. The professor gave a shrug of scorn. And no doubt you've seen the snow people, and have had a perfect afternoon, while, no, I haven't seen any snow people, but I've had a perfect afternoon, all right. As I said, I found the diamond thunderbolt. And here are a couple of chips picked up from around the edge. So saying, Stoddard extended his two specimens toward Professor Prescott, who disdained at first to touch them. Nothing but quartz, was the deprecating comment. The snow has affected your eyesight, as it has my own. I'll say it's affected yours, if you don't recognize diamonds when you see them. But wait till I show you the old thunderbolt itself. It's... More quartz, brusquely. Be sensible, Jack. This diamond thunderbolt thing is a pure myth, like the snow people business. Just because this section of India is known as the land of the diamond thunderbolt, you think you're going to find some precious meteor or other, whereas the term applies merely to the Lama's scepter. Granted, it does, a little impatiently. But did it ever occur to you that where there's smoke, there's fire? Meteor is the word. One struck here once, a diamond meteor, and I found it. Take a look at these two specimens and see what you think. Whereupon, Professor Prescott accepted the glinting gems from his young friend, to gasp a moment later as he held them tremblingly. Good Lord! They're diamonds, to be sure! Where did you find them? Stoddard hesitated before replying. Not far from here, he said at length. Moving off. Come, I'll show you. But the professor stood firm on their narrow ledge. You must be crazy, he exclaimed. We'll have trouble enough now getting back. It's practically dark already. Then what's the odds? retorted the young geologist. We've got all night. But our friends at Camp Number Four, even now they must think we are lost. Then further thought won't kill them. Besides, We'll be back before morning, and they can't send out a relief party sooner. 
but any moment a storm may come up. You know what that would mean. Does it look likely? scoffed Stoddard, waving his hand aloft. See? There's the moon. She'll be our guide. Professor Prescott looked, saw a slender shallop charting her course among the stars, and for a moment was tempted. But speedily his responsibilities reasserted themselves. No, I can't do it, he said with finality. I owe it to the expedition to return as soon as possible. Furthermore, there's the matter of the authorities. We assured the British we would adhere strictly to our one purpose, to scale Kinchinjunga. A mere formality. No, a definite order from the Lamas. They closed Mount Everest, after the last expedition, you will recall. The Lama Scepter is veritably a diamond thunderbolt of power in this region. Whereupon Stoddard's patience snapped. Listen, he said. I hurried away because I knew you'd be anxious, but I'm going back if I have to. And I say you're not. The professor's patience, too, had snapped. I'm not going with you, and you're not going back alone. As the leader of this expedition, I forbid it. The younger man laughed raspingly as he shook off the hand that clasped his arm. And for a moment, it looked as though the two would fight there on that dizzy ledge above the world. Then Stoddard got control of himself. Sorry, he said. I see I've got to tell you something, Professor. You think I'm merely the geologist of this expedition, but in fact, I'm a Secret Service man from Washington, on the trail of the biggest diamond smuggling plot in history, and here is where the trail ends. Professor Prescott's astonishment at these words was profound. He stood there blinking up at Stoddard, scarcely believing he had heard aright. You, you say you are a detective, if you want. Anyway, if you've read the papers, you must know that for the past year or more, the diamond markets of the world have been flooded with singularly perfect stones. Yes, I recall reading about that. They were thought to be synthetic, were they not? By certain imaginative newspaper reporters, not by the experts, for under the microscope they revealed the invariable characteristics of diamonds formed by nature, the tiny flaws and imperfections no artificial means could duplicate. But didn't I read something, too, about some anonymous Indian Raja who was thought to be raising money by disposing of his jewels? More newspaper rubbish. For one thing, British Secret Service men traced the rumor down and satisfied themselves there wasn't a Raja in India unloading any diamonds. For another, no Raja could possibly have the wealth involved. Why, do you know that since this plot unfolded, over five million carats worth have made their appearance? And that means something like a billion dollars. Phew, whistled the professor. Phew is right, his companion agreed. And not only have the diamond markets of the world been disorganized by this mysterious influx, but the countries involved have lost millions of dollars in revenue, due to the fact that the gems have been smuggled in without payment of duty. But surely, my dear fellow, you don't connect this gigantic plot with your discovery of whatever it is you've discovered. A diamond as big as a house, that's what I've discovered, and I most surely do connect the plot with it. Did you ever have a hunch, Professor? Well, I had one, and it's worked out. You leave me more in the dark momentarily, declared the older man, glancing around as though to give his words a double meaning. What was your hunch, and how did it come to lead you here? Whereupon Stoddard told him, swiftly, for there was no time to lose. When first assigned to the case, he said he had been as baffled as anyone, but as he had studied the problem, one outstanding fact had given him the clue. All the gem experts agreed that the mysterious flood of smuggled stones was of Indian origin, being of the first water and of remarkable fire. In other words, of the finest transparency and brilliance. Therefore, since they were genuine and were seemingly coming from India, Stoddard had concentrated his attention on this country, seeking their exact source. Investigation showed that there were no mines within its borders capable of producing anything like the quantity that was inundating the market. But, and here was where the hunch came in, 
there was a district in the Sikkim Himalayas of Bengal whose capital was Darjeeling, land of the diamond thunderbolt. Why had it been called that? Was there some legend back of it? There was, he had learned. For though in modern times the phrase had come to apply merely to the Lama's scepter, as Professor Prescott had pointed out, originally it had carried another meaning. For legend said that once a diamond meteor had fallen on the mighty slopes of Kichinjunga. That had been enough for Stoddard. He had followed his hunch, had gotten himself attached to the American Kichinjunga expedition. And that's why I'm here, and all about it, he finished. Now then, are you coming back with me and have a look at my diamond thunderbolt, or am I going back alone? A long moment, the professor debated, before replying. Yes, I'll come with you, he said at length, extending his hand. Forgive me, Jack. I didn't know, or... Forget it, said Stoddard, shaking. How the devil could you, till I told you? But just one thing. Mum's the word, right? Right. And one thing more. It may be, well, a one-way trip. Forget it. Okay, Professor. With a last warm handclasp, leaving them joined in a new bond of friendship, the two men moved on over that narrow, moonlit ridge across the top of the world. It was a desperate trail, Professor Prescott realized after scarcely a dozen steps. The ridge grew narrower, sheerer, and in places they had to straddle it, legs dangling precariously to left and right. Admiration for his gallant companion mounted in the professor's pounding heart as they struggled on, only to picture anyone eager to return such a perilous way after once getting safely back. Other thoughts occupied his mind, too, during the next half hour. More than once he could have sworn he saw small ghostly figures on the ridge ahead, but he made no mention of it, for Stoddard didn't seem to see them. Now they gained the far end of that hazardous ridge where a sloping shelf of jagged rock offered a somewhat more secure footing. Along this, they proceeded laterally for some distance. Suddenly, Stoddard paused and called out, Ah, there we are. He indicated a step pocket to the left. Have a look down there, Professor, and tell me what you see. Prescott lowered his eyes to the depths below to draw back with a gasp, for what he saw was a vast phosphorescent glow like a fallen star. What? What is it? He cried in an awed voice. And back came the ringing reply. The diamond thunderbolt. But the radiance of the thing. It couldn't reflect that much light from the moon. No, and it doesn't. But there's nothing uncanny about it. Just what I expected the thing would look like at night. But come on, Professor. You haven't seen the half of it. The way led down the jagged shelving slope now, and the descent was too precarious for further comment. Ten minutes passed, fifteen possibly, when they reached a sheltered snowless arena where titanic forces had clashed at some remote age. Fragments of splintered rock lay strewn in wild confusion, and among them, glinting in the moonlight, were bright crystals. Picking up one, Stoddard said laughingly, one of Mother Nature's trinkets worth half a million or so. Professor Prescott blinked at it a moment, almost in disbelief, then stooped and picked up one for himself. A diamond that would have made the Koinor look like a pebble. There was no doubting its genuineness. Even in the moonlight, it flashed and burned like a thing of fire. But as the professor turned his eyes at last from its dazzling facets, they failed him again or so he thought, for half hidden behind a jutting crag loomed a huge cylindrical object, seemingly of metal. For the space of two breaths he stared speechless, then gasped, Good Lord! What's that? Following his gaze, Stoddard saw it too. God knows, he muttered in a tense voice. It wasn't there this afternoon. Let's have a look at it. Cautiously, not knowing what to expect, they advanced toward the singular phenomenon. Nearing, they saw that it was a mechanism some twenty feet at the base and sixty or more feet high, pointed at the top. A rocket, declared Professor Prescott. 
though I've never seen anything larger than a laboratory model, I'll gamble that's what it is. And I'll gamble you're right, exclaimed Stoddard. And one capable of carrying passengers, would you say? Fully. Then I think we have solved the mystery of how these diamonds reach the market. The question now is, who's back of this thing? And since our position here probably isn't any too healthy, he broke off and drew his automatic as a small ghostly figure appeared, seemingly from nowhere. The professor saw it too, saw it followed by another and another. And now he knew his eyesight had not failed him, back on that windswept slope above either, for these were actual creatures, incredible as they seemed. The snow people? He did not know, had no time to find out, for with a rush the strange beings were all around them. Stoddard leveled his pistol and called on them to halt, but they came on, scores, hundreds now, seeming to pour out of some unseen aperture of the earth. Once or twice he fired, over their heads, but it failed to halt them. They closed in, jabbering shrilly. But though their words were a babble, their actions were plain enough. Swarming up, they overpowered the explorers by sheer numbers and herded them with jabs of sharp tiny knives toward a cavern mouth that opened presently amid those eerie crags. Led underground, they found themselves proceeding along a frosty passage lit every few yards by a great chunk of diamond. Their dim glow seemed to be refracted from some central point beyond. This point they soon reached, a great vaulted chamber whose brilliance was at first dazzling. Its source, after the first moment or so, was obvious. It was coming from the roof, which was one vast diamond. You see where we are? whispered Stoddard, under the diamond thunderbolt. These people have tunneled beneath the meteor, or else... Their tunnel was already there when the meteor fell, finished Professor Prescott. But can it be possible such creatures could have produced that rocket? I'm inclined to think anything is possible now, but I'm sorry I dragged you into this, Professor. I... Forget it. We're here, and we'll face it together, whatever it is. You're a game, sport. Stoddard gripped the older man's hand. We'll face it and lick it. Further talk was interrupted by a stir among their captors. The ranks parted, and into that dazzling chamber stepped a tall, bearded personage whose aristocratic features and haughty bearing suggested a Russian of the old regime. He strode toward them, smiling sardonically. Greetings, my friends. Nice of you to drop in on me while in the neighborhood. His English was suave, precise. Professor Norman Prescott, leader of the American Kinchinjunga expedition, I believe. He paused and lifted inquiring eyebrows to his other guest. And Dr. John Stoddard, our geologist, came the answer stiffly. And you, sir? A fellow professor, you might say. Prince Ivan Krasnov. You have heard of me, perhaps. Prescott had indeed. One of Russia's most brilliant and erratic scientists under the Tsar. The man had been permitted to continue his work for the Soviets, developing, among other inventions, a rocket reported to be capable of carrying passengers. But some two years ago, he and his rocket had vanished in the course of a test flight from Moscow. And the natural conclusion was that he had either perished in the sea or shot off the earth altogether since no trace of the unique mechanism was ever found. Yes, I have heard of you, said the professor, recalling this sensational story that had occupied the front pages of the world's press for days. And so it turns out that your rocket didn't come to grief. Not exactly, though, as you can see, it landed me in rather an inaccessible spot, was the reply, but quite an interesting one. I was well satisfied to let the papers report me missing. You can understand, yes? I think I can, that part of it. While, as for Stoddard, he was beginning to understand a great deal. But these curious creatures, he said, indicating the whispering pygmy host that filled the cavern. You found them here? They found me, corrected the prince. But we get on quite well together. They consider me a god, you see, since I too came out of the sky in a thunderbolt 
as their great diamond once did, according to their legends. But who are they? What is their origin? Why are they so small, so pale? Natural questions, Professor, but not so easy to answer. Who they are, I cannot say, save that they are the snow people of native superstition. Their origin? It is lost in antiquity. Perhaps they are the remnants of some Tibetan tribe driven into the mountains by enemies thousands of years ago. While as for their stature, their pallor, these, no doubt, are the result of the furtive underground life they lead. He paused, waited politely, as though for further questions, but neither spoke. Now that the main mystery was solved, the one question uppermost in both their minds was what this suave, inscrutable nobleman was going to do with them, and that question neither cared to ask, fearful of what the answer might be. Finally, Prince Krasnov spoke again. What? Gentlemen? You have no further curiosity about me? How unflattering! I thought, perhaps, you might want to know why I have chosen to maintain my headquarters here on Kinchinjunga the past two years, and how I have been occupying my time. But I hold no resentment. I shall tell you so that you will be prepared for what I am going to propose. He turned and addressed the pygmy host in what must have been their own tongue. Then, facing his guests again, he said, Now come, let us retire to my private study, where we shall have more leisure. They followed him from the dazzling chamber and proceeded on down the cavern to a fork that ended about twenty paces further in a massive steel-bound door. There he paused and twirled a knob like the dial of a safe. After a moment there came a click as of tumblers meshing, and a tug on the knob swung the door open. The prince bowed. Step into my little apartment, he said. They entered to find themselves in a large oblong room furnished in Slavic luxury. As they crossed a rich oriental rug spread over the threshold, a musical gong sounded somewhere, and almost instantly two enormous Cossacks sprang into view to bar their way with rifles. My bodyguard, apologized Krasnov, shutting the door. They are quite harmless, except to intruders. Just one of the little precautions that make life safer. He spoke to the men in Russian, and they withdrew. Then he advanced to a divan beside a teakwood table on which stood a large copper samovar. Dropping down, he motioned for them to take seats beside him. You will have tea, my friends? Or perhaps you would prefer whiskey and soda? They chose the latter since their recent exertions seemed to have warranted it, and their host tinkled a silver bell, bringing a Chinese boy beaming and salaaming. A few words to him and the samovar was lit. Then he hurried off on padding feet to return with miraculous speed, bearing not only the whiskey and soda, but a platter heaped with exotic cakes, cubed sandwiches of caviar and spiced fish, together with a profusion of other delicacies, doubly welcome to men who had toiled all day on a mountain peak with nothing but chocolate to sustain them. And while they drank and ate, Prince Krasnov told his story, a story whose very first words were an admission that he was the head of the great diamond smuggling plot Stoddard had set out to trace down. End of Section 8 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Okay, that is the end of part one. Come back next week for part two of The Diamond Thunderbolt by H. Thompson Rich. You will not be disappointed. Johnny, is this true? Okay. I like to surf the internet looking for stories and other oddities. I do this in the name of the podcast, but the truth is, it's fun to see what's out there. What you're about to hear is what I call... Johnny, is this true? I will tell you a story and then ask the question, did I make it up or is it true? Let's get started.
This time on Johnny Is It True, we return to the original charter. I will present you four random stories, and all you have to do is figure it out if I made it up or ripped it from the pages of an actual news story. Sound like fun? Well, now that you mention it. British guy, I didn't ask you. Story 1 This one comes to us from the British Broadcasting Corporation. A woman was found on the roof of a McDonald's. She explained that she had been abducted by aliens and they had dropped her off there. The aliens were quite nice about it and gave her enough burgers and fries to sustain her until her rescue. Later, it was determined that she had been stuck up there for several days and had been going inside the store to make food while it was closed. Could this have possibly been a major headline on the BBC? No, no, it's not. Not even a little bit. I devised this little gem while drinking margaritas in the sun. Okay, that's a lie, too, because in the Northwest, everybody knows we don't have any sun. Story 2 Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, how lovely are thy branches. Those are the lyrics to a popular Christmas carol about a tree so wondrous it roused musicians to write an entire song about it. But this year, one London Christmas tree didn't inspire people to burst into holiday carols. The Norwegian city of Oslo has given a Christmas tree to decorate Trafalgar Square since 1947. Usually quite majestically. However, the spruce that was put up this year disappointed onlookers who described it as sparse, anemic, and quite sad. One person asked the tree's Twitter account, Are you a joke? Now, was this a joke, or did London suffer through with a less than ideal tree? Well, if you said this one was a joke, you are partially right. The 90-year-old Christmas tree stood about 80 feet tall, and from certain angles it looked droopy and uneven, almost as if a painter gave up halfway through painting it. One bystander joked, What did this country do to deserve such a tree? Story 3 The Seattle Times reported this story on March 8, 1895. Bigfoot seen in downtown Tacoma. That's right, the big fellow roamed the streets of Tacoma, Washington for an entire afternoon wandering around looking into storefront windows. No pictures were taken because the beast refused to stand still. Now, was this a real news story or just a fantasy projected from my own thoughts? Well, the truth is, is that the Seattle Times didn't start to publish anything until August 10th of 1896, so this one has to be a lie. Although it probably would be hard to get Bigfoot to stand still for a picture. Oh, and don't get me started on Slofies with an iPhone 11. Story 4 This one comes from Denver, Colorado, via Reuters. A man with a white beard was arrested for robbing a bank and throwing stolen cash into the air while shouting, Merry Christmas to all! The man was later apprehended at a nearby Starbucks coffee shop, according to the police report. This can't be true, can it? It can't be. This is amazingly true. A police spokesperson and eyewitness accounts stated that a man stepped outside the bank and tossed the money all over the place, yelling, Merry Christmas. The frenzy that followed was a sight to behold. After completing his Christmas gift, the would-be Santa walked over to Starbucks, sat down, ordered a non-fat latte, and waited for police to arrest him. The Denver Post quoted the police as saying, Thousands of dollars remain unaccounted for. David Wayne Oliver, age 65, is in the city jail awaiting his sentencing hearing. How about that? 
Johnny Is It True was brought to you by Gladys Goodies. Great treats for your dog to eat. Do you have any strange but true stories you want to share? If you do, send them to ronsamazingstories at gmail.com and I'll use them if I can. A few weeks ago, I received a package from Gladys Goodies with treats for my kitty. He absolutely loved them, and I'm not just making that up. You too can get these treats and some really cool swag for your dog or cat at gladysgoodies.com. And don't forget to use our promo code, RONS, to get a 20% discount on all of your purchases. Now that website again is gladysgoodies.com. Thank you, Gladdy. Are you ready for an intermission? Intermissions in early films had a practical purpose. They were needed to facilitate the changing of reels. The technology improved, but as movies became progressively longer, the intermission fulfilled other needs. It gave the audience a breather and provided the theater an opportunity to entice patrons to its concession stand. A well-known 1957 animated musical snipe suggested, let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a snack. Here is an example of an intermission that was obviously played during a Western movie. It's a delicious food to eat some every day. Oh, we ride in the rodeo, rope and steers and butts and brussels, and we haven't had a bite to eat since dawn. We are hungry and we're dragging, but here comes the old chuck wagon with the fiddles that we long for. Bring her on! Now, I'm the U.S. Marshal. The soft drinks, I am partial. And this popcorn's good. Hi, guys, I say it's me. You like them, lick them, ice cream, and this ice cream, very nice cream. You buy them, and you try them, and you see. Now it's time for intermission, so let's all hit the trail and gather around the sweet bar where these goodies are on sale. Alas, the intermission has been phased out of Hollywood films these days. The victim of the demand to pack in more screenings, I guess. Also, advances in projector technology have made real switches either unnoticeable or non-existent. Think digital projection. That's it for this intermission. Wow, was that episode number 420? They're really flying by now. This time, I want to thank Cindy Coleman, Scott Wilson, Tom Williams, Jane Dokus, Mike Holden, and of course, Charlie White for his story last week. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, just head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find an amazing number of links that should fit every need. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it. And please, leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. This is what makes podcasts grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.